Talks. Um, this series is a partnership project led by the Prince William Sound Science Center. Our partners include the Alaska Sea Grant Office, um, the Cordova Chapter of Audubon Society, and the Forest Service, who donates the building and the equipment. Tonight's talk is by Ann Schaefer from the Science Center. She's going to be talking about uh, winter birds around here. Uh, next week's talk will be Jake Borst, who's going to be talking about living in Mongolia for a couple of years. He's got some, I got a sneak peek at some pictures and it's be interesting. So. Welcome to Ann. Hi, everyone. Yeah, as Meadow said, my name's Ann Schaefer. I work at the Science Center for Marianne Bishop, so I help with the seabird and shorebird work that they do there. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the research that we do on winter marine birds here in Prince William Sound. And before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the funders that we have, the Exxon Valley's Oil Spill Trustee Council, the Prince of Sound Science Center, and Gulf Watch Alaska. Um, so just a brief outline of what the talk is going to be about. Um, first, I'm going to just briefly give an overview of the types of research we do on marine birds here in Prince William Sound in the winter, so what we're learning about the winter marine bird community, um, the patterns that we're seeing. And then I'm going to talk about the MER die-off that's been happening for just about a year now. So what's happening, um, what's being done, and what everyone can do to help. So about 27 years ago now, Prince William Sound experienced um, uh, quite a large disturbance event that I'm sure you guys all remember, or some of you remember, you've all heard about it, the Exxon Beat Valdez oil spill. And as a result of the oil spill, they estimated that about 250,000 birds died as a direct uh, result of the oil spill. And these are just some photos of uh, like the cleanup effort that went on. Um, here's some oiled mers and then just um, oiled beaches. It was a huge disturbance event in the sound. And so of the uh, birds that overwinter in Chris Williams Sound, nine species were initially listed as injured by the oil spill. And those species included common myrrh, uh, golden eyes, cormorants, oyster catchers, common loons, harlequin ducks, marbled murrelets, kittens of murrelets, and um, pigeon guillemots. They were all listed as injured initially right after the spill. <coughs> And in 2014, they reassessed which species had recovered and which, which resources were still injured. And what they decided was that marbled murrelets and pigeon guillemots still hadn't recovered um, 25 years later, and the recovery status of Kittles' murrelets was unknown. So they just didn't have enough information to uh, make a determination as to its recovery status. Um, a major problem that was encountered in the aftermath of the oil spill is that uh, researchers and managers had a really hard time distinguishing between the impacts of the oil spill and just background variation in marine bird populations. And the big problem was that long-term data sets for pelagic species were pretty absent or non-existent, so there was spotty information, and so they had a hard time parsing out the difference between the impact of the spill on the population from yeah, just the normal background variation. Um, and this made it difficult for managers to assess the damages that had happened to the population and then also um, plan a recovery strategy for different species. And so just to zoom out a little bit, you might wonder, like 27 years later, why do we care if there's a couple bird species that haven't recovered? Or why, do, why does it matter to study these seabird species? Well, um, marine birds inhabit all um, seas and oceans worldwide, which cover 71% of the Earth and contain 97% of our water on the planet. So this is a huge ecosystem on our planet that we as land dwellers have a hard time studying and understanding. And so seabirds are highly visible top predators in the marine environment, and so they're able to act as indicators of the health of the marine ecosystem. So a lot of different studies use aspects of marine bird biology and demography to understand what's going on in the marine ecosystem, such as um, food availability or pro uh, productivity. 
And so, zooming in back on Prince William Sound, most of the research after the oil spill happened um, during the breeding season to try and understand what was going on with the seabirds. Um, and that's pretty normal for seabird research that it would happen during the breeding season because birds, these seabirds are at sea most of the year, they're away from land, they're relatively inaccessible. And during the breeding season, most species congregate in breeding colonies. So they're on land and they're in relatively high densities. However, the non-breeding season may be a critical time period for seabirds because um, food is relatively less abundant, the weather is uh, more extreme, it's more harsh, day lengths are reduced, and sea and air temperatures are cooler. So it's generally a harsher, more extreme environment uh, for seabirds. And so all of this leads us to like the overall foundation for our research uh, program on marine birds at the Science Center which is to conduct long-term monitoring to understand how ecosystem recovery, in addition to changing physical and environmental factors, are affecting marine bird abundance, distribution, and habitat use during fall and winter. And so to achieve this, we've been conducting uh, marine bird surveys over nine winters so far, so um, since 2007 until this most recent winter. And then um, we conduct surveys between September and March. You guys can come sit down. There's plenty of um, and the way we conduct surveys is we place a bird observer on ships of opportunity, which means that these research vessels are already chartered to go out and do some other kind of research, and the marine bird observer just piggybacks on that research. Um, so this has allowed us to collaborate with a lot of different agencies and with a lot of different projects. For example, we have a marine bird observer that goes out on the uh, Alaska Fish and Game Shrimp Pot Surveys. Solstice. On the solstice, yes. Uh, we also collaborate with NOAA and USGS on their humpback whale surveys and forage fish surveys, the auklet. Um, and then also on the Montague, those surveys take place. And then we also collaborate with other projects that are happening at the Science Center. So I, we put a marine bird observer on the herring surveys, the juvenile herring surveys, and then we also have an observer that goes out on the Ocean Tracking Network um, mooring survey, where we go and download data from moorings that are placed across the entrance to Prince William Sound. And um, over these nine winters of surveys, we or nine winters of work, we've done 36 surveys, which is equal to about 7,200 kilometers of survey effort. And each survey lasts about six to nine days. Some uh, last as many as 12 to 13. So it's a huge amount of effort. And what this map is showing you is um, our survey transects. We break up into three kilometer segments. And so this is the midpoint of each three kilometer segment that we've uh, surveyed. So all over the sound, you can see areas that you know we hit more often than others, just because that's where the researchers were going. And so, from all of this effort, what have we learned? Well, we've learned that there's a lot of variation. Um, it changes a lot. And so this is showing the average density of seven different uh, marine bird groups that are in Prince William Sound in the winter time over the nine different winter. Uh, survey years. And it shows that uh, these densities are highly variable across winters, but common MERS are consistently the most abundant species in, in the sound during the winter. And all of this just emphasizes the importance of long-term data sets, so we're able to understand the variability that's occurring in these populations and track that variation with what's going on in the environment. We've also learned that in addition to lots of variation across winters, there's lots of variation within winters, which um, indicates the importance that there are multiple surveys are necessary in order to understand the winter marine bird community in Prince William Sound. Um, so this, is show, this figure shows us um, average November density for those seven species groups and then average March densities for those seven species groups. So just sort of a snapshot of early winter versus late winter. And um, the marine bird community is totally different uh, during those different time periods. 
The most striking thing you notice is just how abundant MERS are in late winter. Um, they're definitely the most abundant species during late winter. But if we ignore common MERS for a minute and focus in on all of the other species, um, you can see that uh, the marine bird community, there are changes, <coughs> the community is different between early and late winter. And this information here is really important because the Fish and Wildlife Service historically would conduct their winter marine bird surveys during March. And as you can see, that if you just did a March survey, you'd be underestimating the importance of Prince William Sound for marbled murrelets, which are more abundant um, in early winter, and there are non-recovered species. Um, large gulls are more abundant in early winter, and small gulls are also more abundant in early winter. And large gulls is mostly glaucous wing gulls, small gulls are mostly new gulls. So three important winter, winter species, the importance of Prince William Sound as winter habitat would be underestimated if you were only looking at this March timetable, or time scale. Um, and this kind of information is important for planning damage assessments, if, or planning management activities. Um, we've also been able to identify areas of persistent marine bird concentration. So um, around Gravina, in Gravina and Mills Head, down in Montague Strait, and then also in the Southwest Passages. And what's interesting about this is these are also areas that have been identified by um, our humpback whale surveys as areas that humpback whales tend to concentrate. And as we learned in the talk last week from Dan Olson, these are also areas where um, killer whales tend to concentrate. So that's telling us that there are persistent favorable conditions such as currents or upwelling that are creating favorable um, foraging conditions for marine mammals and um, marine birds. And so um, what we're going to keep working on our uh, marine bird projects. Um, we're going, something that we're going to continue doing is to continue monitoring trend and distribution in relation to habitat variables like we've been doing. And this will allow us to understand what's driving marine bird distribution and abundance in the sound and how that will change as um, habitats alter. We're also going to look at the relationships between marine birds and their prey. So some of our surveys involve taking simultaneous bird observations with forage fish observations. And so this will allow us to get an idea of what um, forage fish schools, what their characteristics that influence seabird abundance and distribution, or the birds that are present or aren't present in a um, given school. And then something new that we're going to start looking at is looking at um, foraging dynamics between marine birds and other predators, such as humpback whales. Um, and yeah, so stay tuned for those results and that research which will be coming up within the next couple of years. Um, this is also just a really brief overview of, this, of the research that we do on marine birds at the Science Center. We've also um, looked at the effects of marine bird predation on herring, on the herring population. <laughs> And we've already done some habitat modeling of bird distribution in relation to things like sea surface temperature and bathymetry. Um, so if you have other questions about what research we've done, feel free to come talk to me after the talk or check out our, our, um, our website. Um, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about the MERS die-off that's been happening for um, about the last year now. It started last March. Um, but before we... Uh, talk about that. I just wanted to give some background about common MERS because they're very cool birds. Um, so let's see. Um, they're relatively large black and white al alcids. They're of the family Alcidae, so they're related to other birds like guillemots and puffins. And they're sometimes referred to as the penguins of the north because they're of their black and white patterns and because their overall body shape is pretty similar to that of a penguin. Um, the estimated global population is about 13 to 20 million birds, but here in Alaska we have about 2.8 million breeding birds. Um, and like other alcids, they have a stout, streamlined bodies, they have short, narrow wings, they have very thick, waterproof um, feathers, and they have short tails, and their feet are set really far back on their bodies. And um, they, ha they have a relatively long lifespans. I think the longest recorded life in the wild is about 42 years, 
They reach sexual maturity at about five years, which is pretty late, and then when they breed, they breed um, once per year, and they lay one egg per clutch. So relatively slow life histories. <coughs> And like most other seabirds, they spend the majority of the year at sea. And you can see their distribution on the west coast extends from northwestern Alaska all the way down to California into Mexico. And they only come to land to breed. The rest of the time, they're at sea. And what's really cool about MERS is that they can dive up to 180 meters, which is 590 feet, which is insane. And the reason they're, part of the reason they're able to do this um, is their wings they use to swim, to fly under the water. And having their feet set, set so far back on their body also helps them swim underwater. Um, it makes them really awkward on land, though. But um, and even though they can dive up to 180 meters, they typically forage at um, depths of 20 to 50 meters. Um, and they usually, they primarily eat fish, but they'll, small fish, but they also eat euphausses and cephalopods. So, um, with the, starting last March, we started seeing headlines like this, but they really picked up in late December and early January of this year after 8,000 common murder carcasses were counted on a one mile stretch of beach near Whittier. And that really caught the attention of both local but at national um, media outlets as well. Um, and yeah, starting last December or last March, reports of thousands of dead or dying MERS were reported all along the West Coast to wildlife officials. This is data from COAST, which is the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. It's a team of citizen sciences that are assigned a beach, and they walk it about once a month and keep track of what has washed up. And so it's a long-term data set um, of marine, of you know whatever washes up on the shore, whether it be sharks or fish or birds, what have you. And so as you can see, the die-off was really reported all the way from Alaska to about southern Oregon. Um, it started in March 2015, as I said, but this figure starts in May. And looking at this figure, the gray represents the long-term average per month. <coughs> so May to December. Um, and then yellow represents the monthly average for 2015. And you notice a couple things when looking at this figure. First, the lower 48 have way higher rates of um, common mer, common mers washing onto their beaches. Um, Alaska has very small uh, long-term averages. You also notice that for all areas, there was this big pulse to, right after the breeding season of mortality. But for the Gulf of Alaska, this mortality event was consistent throughout the entire pre-breeding season, breeding season, and after the breeding season. So it was a prolonged mortality event in the Gulf of Alaska. And what that figure is missing is it was released in the middle of December, so it missed like our big peak in the die-off. Um, and um, it also didn't include any of January. And so this figure does include December and January. It's just looking at uh, MER reports for Alaska from May to this last January, and it does include those 8,000 birds counted near Whittier. And there's also, you can see a huge mortality event reported near Seward, also near Homer. And so it's been very widespread throughout the state since May. And so in addition to the reports of birds washing up on beaches, there's also increased reports of um, MERS being caught in nets as bycatch during this past gillnet season out on the flats. I just anecdotally from gillnetters, we heard there were just a lot more than what was usual. Um, something else unusual that's been happening are the inland strandings of common MER. There were common MERS reported as far inland as Denali National Park and Fairbanks which is crazy because these are seabird. They spend their entire lives at sea. They don't come in land. They can't take off from into flight from the ground. Um, so when they get that far inland, they're uh, out of luck. 
Um, we got, there were also reports of MERS foraging and swimming on freshwater rivers and lakes, which is unusual. Um, and then we've also had reports of MERS staying just generally nearer to shore during the winter months. They typically spend the winter months out in the Gulf away from shore. And something that's interesting about that is that we were actually able to document that near shore distribution during our surveys. So this figure is showing all of our MER densities from all of our surveys since 2007. 2007 to 2014 densities are in black, and just our 2015 surveys are in red. And what you can see is last February, immediately before the die-off began, we counted way higher numbers of, of MERS in Prince William Sound than in previous years. Um, we also recorded this past November, right before the big peak in the die-off, we saw, again, significantly higher numbers of birds within Prince William Sound. So in our surveys, we were able to document that these birds were staying inshore, way farther inshore than they normally do. And so in response to the reports of these massive wrecks, um, an interagency, so groups of um, like federal and state agencies, nonprofits, um, came together to document the die off. And so we did a series of at sea surveys, um, beach walks, carcass collections, and field necropsies um, to try and figure out what's going on and document the extent of the die off. And this figure summarizes the results from our at sea surveys and our beach walks, and it also includes data from some anecdotal reports that were sent in in December and January. And the at sea surveys were conducted January 1st through 10th uh, in 2016, so right after the big windstorms that swept through and all the carcasses were counted. Um, and what you can see on this figure is these open circles are areas that were surveyed, but no birds were, no dead birds were recorded. And you'll notice that. Most of the mortalities were over in the northwestern part of the sound, but if you look across, there are mortalities widely distributed throughout all of Prince William Sound, you know, in deep water habitats, in shallow habitats, in bays, in passages, so in all sorts of different habitat types. And here are some results from those surveys. Um, we surveyed 451 kilometers of ocean and we counted dead common yearlets on 24% of all of the transects that we surveyed. And the average, or the minimum average density of dead MERS that was counted was 3.7 dead MERS per kilometer squared. And so if you were to extrapolate that to all of the waters of Prince William Sound, not just what was surveyed, that would come up with about 33,500 dead MERS. Um, however, these weren't systematic or random surveys at all, so that number will be biased in one direction or the other, like most likely. Um, the results from the beach surveys were, so 184 kilometers of beaches were surveyed, 174 of those were surveyed from boats looking at the beach, and then 10 kilometers of beaches were walked. And it's, they counted about 17,000 dead birds, but then applying a correction factor that they tested in the field, it came up with an estimate of about 22,000 dead MERS on the surveyed beaches. And then we also received anecdotal reports from um, lo people in local communities, people riding ferries, hunters, hatchery workers, and they sent in about 4,450 um, observations observations of 4,415 dead MERS um, in December and January. Got a question for you? Yeah. So would you add those two totals, 33,521,759? Yeah, so those are separate totals. And yeah, so we'll get there in a minute. Um, and so looking at those anecdotal reports, uh, local reports, a lot of Cordovans have been sending in reports, so thank you for keeping an eye out. Um, since November, we've been receiving reports until even in March, so just within the last few days, we've still been getting reports. Um, but most of the reports that came in were from December, early January, after those big storms. And um, from our local reports, those are, that has accounted for about 1,000 dead MERS. But not all of those have been right around Cordova. These are some people, you know, are out 
fishing and they see them along Hawkins, or some of these are from the hatcheries. But local cordovans have been doing their part. Um, and most carcasses that have been reported have been heavily scavenged by coyotes and um, eagles. And so this is where, what you're asking about. If you take all of that together, I'm going to add a note here so I don't mess it up. Um, so from the surveys, the uh, at sea surveys, um, what we've counted is about 27,000 dead birds. But with that extrapolation and added together, um, it comes out to about 60,000 dead birds in Prince William Sound. But given that surveys were only conducted on a small fraction of beaches and observations of dead birds were very widespread in Prince William Sound, um, our collaborators at USGS think that total mortality within Prince William Sound is likely much higher. And there was also mer mortality reported in Cook Inlet, on Kenai, in Kenai, over by Kodiak during the same time period. And this diet has been going on since last March, as we've seen from the other figures. And so um, the estimate is likely in the order of magnitude of the hundreds of thousands. Although, I mean, there would be a huge error around that number. But that's the order of magnitude that they're thinking the die-off is, is, um, is in. Um, so the obvious question is why? Why is this happening? What's causing all of this? And what, we're, what we've learned from our, the necropsies that we've done and the samples that we've sent into the National Wildlife Health Center or Health Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, is that these birds are starving. Um, so this is uh, common bird body weights in the Gulf of Alaska during the breeding season. The average is about 1,054 grams. And this shows uh, mer body weights that were collected from birds just at the beginning of January here, and these are the birds that we did the field necropsies on, and the mean is 738, so quite a bit different. And then these are the birds that were sent in to the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, so just about the same, and they were collected about the same time period. And then down here shows the weights of common mer carcasses that were collected during the most recent die-off which was in 1993 in the Gulf of Alaska. And so you can see these birds aren't doing well. Their distribution and weight looks more like um, that which happened in the previous data. Um, but what's interesting is that most are above this critical mass threshold, you know, after which they can't, life is not sustainable for the most part. Um, and this is supported by our necropsy results also, that starvation is a key factor in what's causing the die off. All of the birds are underweight. They have emaciated pectoral muscles. Their stomachs are empty. There's little to no subcutaneous fat. Um, so these birds were not in good condition when they died. But why are they starving? We don't really know, but we have some ideas. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of the blob, the warm water blob that was detected uh, in the Pacific Ocean uh, in fall of 2013. It's still there, and it extends from Alaska all the way down to Mexico, and it's actually three blobs. But, um, and it, the blob was caused not by the warming of the water, but lower than normal heat loss from the water to the atmosphere. So it's not necessarily there's more heat going in, there's just less heat coming out. And so that's led to this water mass, This stable water mass in the water that's not circulating, and so it's a lower productivity area than, you know, what's normally there. Um, lower productivity in terms of phytoplankton and zooplankton. And so that's an affecting the, could be affecting the upper trophic levels, like with birds. And it's also an El Nino year or two now, and so these two, uh, that also increases the temperature of the water, and we found that in previous El Nino years, marine sea creatures tend to redistribute themselves northward um, to find cooler waters. So it could be this combination of this warm water blob combined with El Nino that's changing prey distribution of common mers. Common mers, as I said, usually eat uh, forage with fish, which um, tend to prefer these cool water lenses at the top of the water column or near the top of the water column. 
So either they're, they've shifted themselves deeper into cooler water where MERS can't get them, or just um, somewhere else where MERS are finding them to a less predictable location. <coughs> um, they've also been looking into whether there was pathogens or biotoxins or heavy metals. Um, but so far, there's no evidence of this. All of the sample, none of the samples they've sent to the lab in uh, Wisconsin have come up with um, positive results there. And then the storms at the beginning of the year likely just pushed birds that were already stressed over the point um, that they could handle. So that probably increased um, the impact of the diathem, or increased the intensity of the diathem at that time. And so, just to put this in context a little bit, die-offs happen, they occur regularly um, in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and common mer die-offs, or mer die-offs have all have been reported, you know, a number of times in the last hundred years or so. Um, these are just a few examples that I found in the literature, um, not, definitely not a complete list. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the most recent die-off that's happened in the Gulf of Alaska with MERS, which was in 1993, uh, common MERS are also called common guillemots, so same species, I promise. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the similarities that we're seeing now with what they saw before. So, mortalities were concentrated in western Prince William Sound and the southern Kenai Peninsula. Um, they noted that MERS stayed distributed close to shore during the winter instead of entering offshore as they normally do. Um, which is what we saw within the last couple winters. Um, they counted about um, 3,500. They estimated about 11,000 on beaches, but when they extrapolated that estimate, it was on the order of magnitude of 120,000. Um, birds were starving, and other mortality sources were negative or inconclusive, as we're seeing now. And then I wanted to highlight this sentence from the paper which said, reduced food availability could have been related to anomalous sea conditions found during the prolonged 1990 to 1995 El Nino event. So it could be, you know, something similar going on, but just at a, grand, a bigger scale, because this year is different in the spatial extent and also the time scale that this diet has been happening. And so, how can you all help? Well, first of all, don't touch or collect any of the sick or dead birds. They haven't found disease really in any of the carcasses, but you don't want to be the unlucky person who gets the gross carcass. Um, also, let us know what you see. If you notice birds exhibiting odd behavior, if you're seeing feather piles in the woods on your hikes, or if you're out on the water or on the beach and you see dead birds floating or washed up, please let us know when and where you saw them. Um, if you can tell what kind of species it is, and the number. And we're all lucky these days because we carry really nice cameras in our pockets all the time. So take photos if you see it. Um, you can call us at the Science Center, and this is my email address. It's also on the website. So let us know if you see weird stuff. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank our funders and all the different collaborators on the surveys and on the projects. Questions, if you have any. Thanks. Do you have any info from Progress Resolution? Mm -mm. This was the, um, we've been summarizing just the data from um, the Prince William Sound area, and that's what we've been focusing on. But they are sending a survey out of Homer starting. The weather's looking really bad the next few days. They were going to try and get off this week, but it's looking more like next week now to go, um, yeah, try and get a handle on what's happening out there. There's a former school teacher that was here that's now teaching Dutch Harbor. She said Dutch Harbor's got dead murders. Still, yeah, yeah, they were getting, we were getting reports on Kodiak. So, um, does anybody count other predatory birds like bald eagles to see if these birds actually <coughs> benefit from these large die-offs and that their, you know, recruitment the next year is actually increasing due to this abundant food source? Now? I don't know if anyone's done that, mm -hmm. but it's cool. Like, the eagles have definitely been having a heyday with the dead birds. I mean, 
all the birds you see are torn to shreds. Um, and the otters, someone sent me a picture of an otter chewing on a myrrh in the harbor. Um, it was a river otter. Um, yeah. I think that would go a lot of different directions too. You see a lot more great blue herons making it through the winter here, you know, number wise. There's a lot of, a lot of years the eagles will attack and eat the great blue herons in the winter, but with all the e easy food of the MERS, the herons will do real well. One thing I heard somebody at the science symposium say when some of those interior MERS were taken to the bird rescue places, they had a real hard time finding the food that worked for them. I mean, they, they've taken care of puffins before and they take care of other seabirds, but the MERS were real different in getting a diet that worked. Because this is his own, this die off is just hitting them and yeah. not other birds. So it's weird these guys have got a weird diet. Like fish yeah, birds. yeah, they've got a weird diet requirement and they were kind of taken aback at the bird rescue places because the, they couldn't, they had a hard time getting a handle on what worked for them. Yeah, and it's odd because there's a really big Cassin's auklet die off um, in Northern California and parts of Canada. And we really, I mean, we saw some of that here, but not to the extent that they did. And we're not, I mean, they occur here, but we're not seeing them mixed in with the MERS that are dying. And it does look like it's males and females and all age classes of MERS that are dying. We're seeing juveniles and adults. What was the, maybe you showed a slide, but what was the population um, in comparison to an average year before the die-off began? Do I don't, yeah, I don't think we know that. What was the most, the most recent estimate I could find for Alaska was 2.8 million breeding birds, but I'm not sure if that was, I'm not sure. But the, there wasn't any noticeable anomaly between the surveys immediately before? We don't have like an Alaska bird yeah. estimate that happens every year because I mean, that survey effort would just be way too um, great. Yeah, expensive, time consuming. Yeah, so I don't think we know that. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does a summer bird count. Mm -hmm. And that, that maybe should be available. Mm -hmm. They didn't do one last summer, um, but they did it the summer before, and they'll be doing another one this summer. So we should get an idea of. Well, I seem to recall maybe two springs ago, I was trolling by Channel Islands, and the light was, it was off this time of year, and the light was, it was good. And with binoculars, you couldn't count how many years ever. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, Bob, just the other thing about the summer surveys is, um, there aren't that many mirrors that um, breed here in Prince William Sound, so the summer numbers are very different from the winter numbers. Oh. I wonder why there's so many dead birds showing up in Whittier. I mean, where, where are the nearest breeding colonies? Where, 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 where are well, yeah, there's a breeding colony down mm -hmm. on Hinchinbrook, Hinchinbrook right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there about Smith Island? I'm not sure about Smith. I don't think so. And then Wooded Island's up Monty. Not much. Yeah. 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 And then you go to Wingham Island, that's about well, it, in the but summer, especially in the summer. fall, there was a lot, like she was showing in the graph, there were a lot of these MERS seen in inside waters, right. like that November, but it was, that was showing up even in September, August and September, there were just so many MERS around Green Island, and it seems like they just kept moving north. But yeah, those fish are going to colder water by the glaciers, and the, but staying deep, and the birds still couldn't get them, and... Yeah, that was where they had their last hurrah, and, and then a big wind just blew in the river. Yeah, it yeah, could have just been the winds and currents wind blowing them that wind way. Wind yeah, because there were, I mean, I don't know what the gusts got up to, but there was that big windstorm for yeah. a few days right at the beginning of January. Yeah, birds were blowing apart from the top people and the other part of Fairbanks, too. Is there any, and not just the Pennsylvania Sound population, but is there any data on the side side? Yeah. Between before and after, especially with this two year old female? I don't know. I'm just curious what that foraging pattern looks like, judging by what we're seeing. What we're seeing. Yeah, I'm not sure. Have people, have they put sat tags out on the bur MERS around here? I'm sorry, they have. Have they put sat tags or any kind of tags out on MERS? Here? No, well, Scott Hatch put some out years ago um, on some breeding colonies. And um, so I think they've got data on maybe 10 mirrors. 
is all. And, and this, yeah, that was all before recent. this data. That's not recent data. No, no, that's from almost 20 years ago. Yeah. How good is overall long term, I mean, very long term abundance uh, survey data? I mean, that raises the question if, if not part of the die off itself might be a cyclical cause of overpopulation. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, die-offs do happen occasionally. It might just be part of their life history where they become too abundant, you know, for the resource or reach no, some sort of carrying capacity. It could just be right. part of their normal life cycle. But we don't, that data doesn't exist what the abundance over, over a very long time our, is. I don't think our abundance data is good enough, consistent enough over time. To, I, maybe it would be to look at that, I'm not sure. Can you age the, the species? So do you have any They've demographic been, parameters of like who who's more likely to die? So it's been males and females and juveniles, adults. It's been all age classes that have been collected. So was it die off back in ninety three due to starvation as well? Did yep. you say that? Yeah, uh -huh. yep. All the birds were pretty emaciated, basically the same stuff that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. And they attributed it to that a prolonged El Nino. So during El Ninos, we get warmer waters here in the Gulf. What do MERS eat or need that's so different from other seabirds? I mean, they eat forage fishes. They cave in. They eat walleye, pollock, so they eat young they herring. Like, what are they missing right now? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, and it's interesting because we've got man like reports from people too over in Juneau at the harbor out at uh, Ock Bay. You know, there's they've seen huge schools of herring, of young herring in the in their bay over there, and you know, kitty wakes going crazy on them and other gulls, but you know, mers dabbling around. So I mean, there does seem to be forage fish in the water, but maybe it's not what they're expecting, or not as much as it usually is, or it's more unpredictable in distribution and behavior. I don't know, forage fish are really hard to study. So we don't have a lot of information. You know, um, I'm a fisherman and we did see a lot more. Yeah. Where is this summer? I mean, way, way more than usual. So, I mean, all concentrated in these areas. You know, they're, they're, some's bringing them in there, obviously, and they weren't, they were healthy birds. Okay. Um, so they weren't dying at the time. So <clears throat> I'm just wondering if. Like Mark suggested, this population, just a large population, you know, they just feed themselves out, you know, they just don't, uh, can't survive, you know. Yeah, I mean, and it could be, and we do see that die-offs happen, as a, have happened before, they'll probably happen again. Um, this is something that does happen in this population, and they've recovered up until now. But what's different about this die-off is just how long it's been going on and the spatial extent, which is not... And limited to birds. For the most part. In Alaska, yes. Yeah. Was the 93 die off all species specific as well? Yeah, it was mostly MERS. The 93 die off, did they keep close tabs after that on um, rebounding the population? I mean, being only reaching maturity at such a late age and only laying one egg, I mean, it just seems like it. Could be a, a pretty good leg and then rebounding to back to their population. Well, I would think that after the oil spill, like the importance of having a long term data set and consistent monitoring was really um, valued or that was prioritized. So there has, I would think, more consistent research of um, or monitoring of the population since then, but I don't know if that's specific. looked back at the trend data for that. Well, thank you so much.